So let me just kind of put in these points here. This is so. So we went essentially through the news file for 2.5, kind of reminded ourselves um, what are the major pieces in there. There's more in the news file than you see on this slide. There's also actually more in the extensive change logs um, yeah. than you see in the news file because there are lots of little changes going in there. But these are the main pieces. So and Seth did all the work on the. Um, on, on finishing at least the SMB and yeah. are getting it merged in based on like all the work that has been done in the past. Yeah, so I, I don't think we have too much to say about the SMB analyzer at this point. I mean, it was covered already, but I mean, certainly feel free to email me or the list or some, probably the list now, it's in master, don't email me. <laughs> <laughs> some, Martin can fix the problem. But you can send him that one PCAP which doesn't the, work. Or the, right? Yeah, if there's one PCAP that doesn't work. So it, actually one little, one little note about that. So there, were, there was for a really long time um, bugs showing up in the SMB analyzer and someone would send me a PCAP. I'd finally, I'd finally managed to get a PCAP of it. And then I, every single time I'd have like five packets and I would spend two hours to figure out what the actual problem was. And it just was like two hours and two hours and two hours. Someone would send me a little teeny PCAP and it was like always this dismay because they're like, I'm going to spend two hours figuring out some little new thing about SMB I wasn't aware of. But maybe someone else can spend two hours and figure out what's wrong with some of that stuff now. Yeah. So yeah, SMB, big new feature in 2.5. Second big new feature is Johanna's net control framework. And, and uh, Johanna talked about that actually extensively um, last year at Brocon. And, and she mentioned it earlier yesterday, I think, briefly. So, so just briefly to recap, net control is essentially a, a standardized interface um, inside Bro to talk to your network equipment. Um, it could be open flow switches. Um, that could be other kind of software having control over your, your network. And it gives you, like, inside the Bro scripting language, this nice framework, this nice high-level API to do certain actions in a, in a pretty much abstract way initially. So basically, you just say drop IP address right? or shunt the flow if you don't want to analyze it completely anymore. And the net control does all the hard work in the background, and, and you just essentially configure it to know how to talk to your network. There, there are different backends, and if there's something your hardware is not supported, it's pretty easy, actually, to, to add another backend. Um, and, and that way, we have this, this nice new abstraction to actually react to stuff proceeds. And um, this was originally a research project, and Johanna did a lot more work after that paper was published to actually make it work in practice. And, and Berkeley Lab has completely transitioned over to using it at this point. And, and I, OK, so I have a question. I'll just ask it in front of everyone, because I think I suspect other people are going to ask the same question. Would I, so, and I'll just ask Johanna, would I be able to release, so we have in our office in Columbus a D-Links, a 54-port D-Link switch. Would I be able to release a package that then adds that? So someone could install that package and support their D-Link switch. Yes. Yes, OK, good. <laughs> All right, so you might see a uh, D-Link switch support package <laughs> come out from me, just in case anyone is using D-Link switches in their infrastructure. <laughs> Net control is a complete script level framework, so there, there, there's no core code going in there, and that's why it's easy to write another backend, actually. You write another ball script. So then we have a bunch of uh, intelligent framework yeah. extensions. Yeah, so um, I, had, I had worked a while ago with uh, Jan Grosshofer, who is, a, I think, a master's student somewhere in Germany. Yeah, at, at Karlsruhe, I think. Okay, so he, uh, he was interested in like, looking into it, and every time I find someone interested in working on something, it's like, yes, 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 please do it, because I don't want to do that work, because I have too many other things to do. And, uh, sorry, I was pointing at Martin. He, that was a great example, because I didn't have to do much of anything, and he just did everything. But um, the, he was interested in it, and so we had this call, and we talked through, like, you know, what are the things that are probably sort of wrong with the Intel framework right now, and how could it be better? And then not only how could it be better, but some of this stuff is not even obvious how it would work. And so we had this whole discussion about how would, how would it work, and how would we actually make it do the stuff that it, we think it needs to do. And it's things like um, deleting intelligence. He actually added a mechanism for doing that. It actually kind of works as a rolling internal expiration where things get refreshed. So it's more like things automatically fall out is if they're not refreshed regularly. Um, and I hope that works. It seems to be working for him. Thanks, OK, that, that was actually, uh, Jan was interning. Adam was saying we should thank CERN for that a little bit. He was interning at CERN while, uh, when he started that work. And then, but in his defense, he finished it sort of on his own time because it wasn't even his uh, research project or anything. 
Um, but he just liked it and kept playing with it. So it was sort of another really nice external contribution that, uh, that we got. And it added a few features. He's, there's going to, I think Adam had even commented on it. There's going to be a blog post coming out um, soon. People on the dev, the bro dev list have actually already seen the blog post because it's been discussed there. Um, we keep trying to be more open and having less stuff hidden. Um, so uh, the, the intelligence framework extensions are nice because this is, this is sort of where uh, people um, commenting on things that they don't like is actually really good because it ta sometimes it takes a while to actually see the better abstractions that could be done and what, the work that actually needs to be done um, to make some component of Bro better because people have complained about various aspects of the Intel framework for a couple of years now. And unfortunately, it, it took a while to figure out what actually needed to be done. But this is definitely one of the areas where, you know, eventually, you know, someone figured it out and kind of did something that seems to work pretty well and should solve most of the problems that people are encountering. And hopefully the blog post will help people get kind of kick-started with doing whatever they want to with it and using it in a way that fits their use case better. So then we have actually a pretty nice, um, a small but nice uh, extension to, to Bro Control, which um, can improve performance quite a bit. Yeah, that, that was, uh, it was, we were sort of trying to figure out, because Robin was going on a three-week vacation. <laughs> and um, I guess it wasn't all vacation, but whatever. He was gone for three weeks. And he was pushing pretty hard to get um, a code, code code freeze for 2.5 so that we just stop putting features and things in. And I suddenly was like, oh no, we forgot about this one thing that we really wanted to get in, and it was splitting the process of logging out from the manager. So if any, I'm sure a lot of people in here run clusters, and you have the manager, and you have workers. Just ignore proxies for now, but there's the manager and workers. And there are some things that make your manager crash. And it's frequently, and I'm sure a lot of you have gotten this response from me or others to say, oh, communication overload. Your manager was overloaded, and it stumbled and fell on its face. And um, we, we eventually we realized a while ago, actually about a year or a year and a half ago, that splitting the logging out, so you have a separate bro process that's only doing logging. It's doing nothing else. Like it, it actually runs no bro scripts. There's just nothing running on it, it, but it takes all your logs. It takes so much load off the manager. So suddenly, we've sort of given ourselves this extra CPU time on the manager so that it has less communication than it needs to do. Because some people are, I mean, we're seeing sites that have you know, 100,000 log lines per second, and it's just a huge amount of communication. And that process, if it has to do all this other stuff too, it's, too, it's, it's right up at the top of what it can support, and then it starts dying. And um, so Daniel Thayer at NCSA, I think it was Daniel, is that right, Adam? Yeah, so he, he took it on, and it was just some changes in bro control. There were no changes in order to do this. This is something we could have done five years ago and just unfortunately didn't. Um, but, but this is, again, sort of feedback from the community where people are like, my thing died, and then we're like, we're going to get that fixed, and eventually it got fixed. It's the easiest change, though. Anybody that's running um, 2.5 beta or when the release comes out, you, if you're doing like a single node cluster, you literally just add those three lines, and your thing will run better. Um, Mikal, yes, exactly. You're just, <laughs> We, I was working with Mikhail, and we got it working, and um, he adds that, and it was like a few hours later, six, seven hours later, you emailed me, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the most stable cluster I've ever run, and it was like he added those three lines. And, um, After doing it, uh, I added basically the same amount of traffic that I was fixed, so the, the longer node was running with twice the amount of traffic that previously, and it was... Yeah, and, and the... Uh, you, you were having occasional crashes and stuff, yes. right? Yeah, and then they went away. When went away, we have to rest our bro at least 24 hours. OK, all right. Well, that, that may be some other problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, this is, this is like not only strongly recommended, but this is you should just do this. Like It's, it's, it's going to make things better. And for, for new installations, it's also the default um, you will find in the template configuration file that Pro Control puts in place. 
Yeah, so I guess the comment about adding that is really for people that have an existing node.cfg. Yeah. We really just wanted to point out, because people would upgrade and not think to look at like the template config file and be like, what is this logger thing? I think there's going to be a short blog post coming out after the release talking about this, because I think it's, it's so important that people know about this, that we're going to do just a very short blog post. Hey, add these lines, things will be better. All right, so then we have a bunch of new analyzers, and um, <coughs> we heard about some of them already. Um, so we, have the, we haven't heard about the file entropy analyzer yet, but that is there, so you can measure the entropy of files. Yeah, so the, sorry. <coughs> the, the file entropy analyzer, unfortunately, does cause some performance overhead, because, I mean, if you're doing entropy analysis on every file, it turns out that's not free. Um, there, there are, I think over time, there will be more extensions to it. But hey, it's a nice first step. You were using it for the, the SMB. Um... Uh, and I'm using the oh, fine. OK, OK. You're slightly different. But uh, maybe that's because you didn't want to calculate entropy on the whole file. Yeah. OK, so they, they, he used the function version and taking data into script land and doing that. Uh, one of the features I want to add to that, and it won't be in 2.5, is the ability to say from byte whatever to whatever, calculate entropy on that, and then it'll attach and then just detach when it hits that byte. So that would actually solve your problem and make it work better. Unfortunately, it's not in 2.5. We accept patches, though. So if anyone wants to add that, it's a relatively easy change. So we've heard about RFP already. Um, we can do a radio tab now. We heard from Johanna about the, the various SSL handoffs, which are not supported. We have start TLS. Start TLS. Um, we can log VLAN IDs on, and MAC addresses now. So you can actually have that added to your connection log if you want by, by, by loading. Do you remember the script? Uh, there is a script. There's a script. Um, <laughs> if you look through the policy directory for like VLAN, a file with the name, with the word VLAN in it, yeah, there's a script you can load and it'll add either a MAC, there's one for MAC addresses and one for VLAN. The, the thing that's a little weird about it is, um, as everyone probably knows, I mean, you don't have a direct mapping between like a connection and MAC addresses because you can imagine if, let's say, you've got two routers and maybe you pull the traffic back to one place, but your outbound goes this way and inbound goes this way, you've got two MAC addresses here and two here. So suddenly it doesn't map, but the experience has been in many cases it works fine. And even in the cases where it doesn't work fine, I think the script's still okay. You just have like extra MAC addresses yeah, in yeah. there. Right. I mean, it's just extracting at this point. I mean, this is part of um, some, some effort to make the layer 2 code a bit more flexible and, and ex first extract more data, but also um, maybe change a bit what the notion of a connection is in Bro. So if you, for example, want to have the VLAN ID included in what constitutes a connection in addition to the, to the four tuple, five tuple, um, I think in the future that, that should be possible with these changes. Um, so, and then, yeah, we have a bunch of SSL updates, as, as usual, in the meantime, already. So, then, um, another block, actually, Seth worked quite a bit on, is, is getting better statistics about performance. Um, and, and, and it was a, largely a refactoring, I believe. So, so, we already collected all that information. In some form, it was really hard to get to from Scriptland. Yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so, the, the, the problem, it was the problem statement to begin with. What is Bro doing? Like when, it, when it's running, what's it doing? It, it's really hard to answer that question. Like what's using memory? What's using TPU? And what's, what's happening? How many connections are in memory right now? Like that, those questions don't really have answers in 2.4. And um, I, I'm sure some of you have at various points in time run the MISC profiling script. Um, but the first thing we always say is don't run that in production. And the, I can tell why we say don't run that in production. Um, <clears throat> we say don't run it in production because there's certain things that it does. OK, you have packets coming in at a certain rate. You only have so long to process a packet before you have to process the next one. Otherwise, you drop packets. It's the packet loss problem and why that happens. Um, but if all these packets are coming in, let's say packets are coming in, packets are coming in, and suddenly bro goes, hold on. I got to go look through all this internal state and you know build some stuff and hold on packets, keep going, and it's going through and it's collecting all this data and it's like here's what I'm doing internally and then it goes I'm ready for packets again. It doesn't work real well. That's why we say don't run MISC profiling unless there's a problem that you're trying to debug because the moment that you run it, you'll be like things are great. 
because bro's like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, just taking packets. And, every, and you sit there and you watch it and everything is perfectly fine until it goes, hold on. And it just starts doing that. So you end up with these sort of sporadic packet loss and you, uh, oh, thank you. You, um, you, uh, you don't know why it happened. And it's like you're, trying, you're causing problems by trying to debug problems and it's not fun. So what I did for 2.5 um, two was uh, it, this, and this actually was sort of coming out of Corelight stuff, honestly. It was um, working with a customer that really needed to know quickly what the thing, what it was doing, and they needed to know it all the time. It wasn't something they'd be like, turn it on, find out what's going on, turn it back off. They always wanted to know what was going on. And so we ended up with this series of functions called get something stats. <clears throat> so there's like get packet stats and get, I don't know, <laughs> I can't even remember what they all, there's, there's um, get reassembly stats because there's thing, there are various reassembly buffers in Bro for like stream reassembly for uh, packet transfer for, uh, for TCP reassembly. There's um, bro24, I think, got um, file reassembly. So you can have these file reassembly buffers and you, it'll tell you how much memory is actively being used for these various reassemblers. And there's uh, packet information. There's just all sorts of information. So everyone should load um, misc slash stats in, um, in 2.5. Two it's, actually, it's actually in the default local.bro now, I believe. Um, because what I did, the, the change that I made with these functions was essentially the data is collected at runtime. So instead of this whole thing where bro has to go and dig around, bro just gets the numbers that are already available and gives them to you. So it doesn't have to do any runtime, or like it doesn't have to do any point in time collection of the data and be like, stop, I'm collecting data and I'm iterating through some huge list of things. And it just has a number and it just gives you that number because. The numbers are just kept up to date. Um, and I'm hoping over the next few releases to keep extending the data that's available here because I think it's hugely worthwhile to know what Bro's doing while it's running. It's, it's just so hard to do your job. Like you're doing your job and you'd be like, oh, I'm running this web server that's serving you know, 10,000 connections per second and it doesn't do any logging. I can't turn on logging. I don't know what's going on. Like no one's gonna like that. That's gonna make your job horrible. So we're trying to improve that about Bro, um, just to, just so that people know what's going on while it's running. But it's it is a little difficult because we have to make sure that it doesn't do any big list iteration or anything at runtime too. So we have to be very careful as we're doing that. So then the, the last point on this slide is we have a bunch of new plugins. And uh, for those who don't know yet, so Bro has this, this internal plugin API so that um, at the C++ level, it's actually pretty easy now to extend Bro with new functionality. So it could be a new protocol analyzer, a file analyzer, um, a log writer, an input, fi input framework reader, um, or I think the last type is a packet source. And um, examples of packet sources are AF packet and, and Miracom here. Um, and, and that map. And that, yeah. Um, so, and, and um, I'm really happy to see actually that this, this plugin API is working. So, so we get external contributions for people actually using it to add stuff which otherwise wouldn't be there in Bro. And, and right now, these, these plugins live in, in, in org slash bro dash plugins. It's a subdirectory of the distribution. Um, so if you haven't looked at that directory yet, take a look. There's a readme in there which describes the various plugins, uh, briefly at least. You have to compile them separately currently. So if, you, um, if you're just doing the normal bro install, you won't get any of those, but then you can kind of go there and pick and choose and, and in addition, compile it and install them. Um, going forward, actually, I think we will move these plugins out of the bro distributions into bro packages because a bro package can also be a plugin. Um, Uh, yes, it's actually on the next slide, on the roadmap slide, because <laughs> technically it's not part of 2.5. Yes, yeah, so you might actually see, you know, at, you can imagine sometime, so 2.5 might come out, at, let's just guess next month, 2.5 might come out. You see, you can imagine maybe like the beginning of next year, someone actually sits down and refactors all of those out into, um, into packages. So suddenly you can install it directly and we can actually do updates on those without having to do a new bro release, which is really nice. Yeah. Can you go back to the other yeah. slide just for a second? <clears throat> and I, I did want to point out one thing I like about this, uh, the new plugins part, is if you look at those, AF Packet, the, that plugin was contributed by Jan Grasshofer, the guy that did the intelligence framework updates. Uh, the Kafka one was contributed by Hortonworks. 
actually, I don't know if that's official or just a guy that works at Hortonworks. Um, uh, Miracom was originally contributed by uh, Mikhail Brzezinski. PF Ring, I have absolutely no clue who did that. I, I'm not, I don't know where that came from, actually. PostgreSQL was uh, Johanna. I don't know who uh, Redis was either. And the T does anyone know who like the Redis one was contributed by? Well, we could find it, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. unfortunately, we don't know. But I, what I do like is that this is like external contributions. It's really neat to see people adding these things. And TCPRS was actually a research project. So there was a grad student um, working on a, on a thesis on TCP performance analysis, and he, and he wrote this code. Um, and initially, he had hard coded it into Bro. Um, which made it pretty hard to merge, actually. But then, once we had this plugin API, he turned it over into a plugin, and I think that's exactly the right way to distribute this kind of code. And also, one other thing I wanted to mention: the Radio Tap header for sorry, <laughs> the Radio Tap header for 802.11. That was actually the Sans Holiday hack that got me to finish that up. I wrote the original version on an airplane. You might be able to guess why it was. Anyway. Um, that's, that's where you do your work, right? This, yeah, I do most of my <laughs> stuff on an airplane. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like the uh, PF Ring plugin has been contributed by Mikhail. Oh, one of the PF Ring guys. Al Alfredo Card. Oh, yes. So like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at it. Cardigliano or something. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yeah, that's actually cool. So the PF Ring guys contributed that. All right, so let's, let's move on to the roadmap. And Adam already made the transition easy. <laughs> So actually, no, the next one. So it is. I mean, for, for for me, the Bro Package Manager is essentially part of the roadmap at this point. So we are just launching it essentially here at BroCon, um, with what a few days ago was still an empty master repository. By now, we have how many packages in there? Six. Six. Some, something like that. <laughs> Six, so seven, growing. eight. Actually, uh, it might be seven or eight. Yeah. So it's growing. And um, but as Seth said, we really want to distribute this separately out of out, outside of Pro because it's a separate component and we can update it more quickly that way and we can tune it and, and adapt it. Um, and, and I think the, the broadmap part here is that it's really as um, Seth already said in his talk, it's really a starting point at this point. So it's kind of the minimal version. It, it doesn't do all the things that we envision and we have to I'm sure we have to tailor the model a bit more, but yeah. Getting there. Yeah, and I actually just sent an email a little bit ago suggesting that we change the command line name from bro pkg to bro pkg. Because bro, okay, all right, I was looking to see if anyone else complained. I didn't like the hyphen either. John was okay with it already. He just wanted to get other people to sort of That's approve good. it. But you know, this is, yeah, it seems early enough that if we're going to make a change like that, we only have like right now, and it's sort of off the table after right now. So anyway, that might change. It's nice. It's the same as bro control. So you have bro control, bro package. They don't one. It's not like one has a hyphen and one doesn't. Bro package has both. Ah! Oh! <laughs> there you go. Big stack two. There you go. <laughs> Big stack two. Yeah. We can do that, and then we can just tell everybody put an alias in if you can't yeah. <laughs> deal with it. So as I already said, so bro plugins, I think, will move over, and, and we'll probably start doing that pretty pretty soon. Um, there's this other thought, and and that is the the scripts and policy, basically. Um, the, the, the scripts coming with Bro in the standard distribution, which are optional for people to load, which are not loaded by default um, automatically. And one thought is we could start moving those over into Bro packages as well. So basically take them out of the distribution, um, thereby make it much easier to update them and, 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 and have a more flexible release cycles for these, for these analysis they implement. Yeah, so that is, that is part of the, 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 the question, how do we test pro packages, I think? And, and we, don't, we haven't really settled on, a, on like the one way to do that there, but it, it's part of figuring that out. I, I have started experimenting with it. One of my packages does have a PCAP included with it, and it has a B test included. Like it, I, I gave it a try. The test passes right now. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sure it's going to take some time, but we'll start having recommendations. Yeah for how to do testing with packages. So hopefully people, that'll become a thing in the community that you do that. So that, actually, I should, this should have been done during the package manager talk, but whatever, we'll talk about it now a little bit. Someone had suggested to add a, um, a version number to say, oh, my package supports Bro 2.5. And, and I don't know if I'm right, but I made the, the case that that's actually probably not a good thing. What I'd rather see is a test go in and then we can just run the test on 2.4 and 2.5 and 2.6 and 2.7. And if it passes, if the test is complete, that should mean it works. 
So it, it's it, the problem, and I, I ran, I've run into this for years as I was updating some of my packages to put the, or some of my scripts to put them in the package repository. I noticed my description for it said, this is a script for bro 2.1. That's not really helping anybody because it might run on 2.5 and it might not, but if I had just had a test with it, I don't have to put a note in there that says, oh, this is for 2.1. You just run the test, and if it passes, you can say, oh, it must still work. Yeah. And but can use a hybrid scheme too, right? So you, you define the minimum version maybe of the bro version you need because you know it's not going to work on older versions. You need the specific event or something. And then going forward, the tests essentially catch if something breaks. Yeah. Anyway, more stuff to figure out. That's why it's on the future-looking roadmap part. <laughs> so then there's the, the bro cluster, and that's something we, we talked a little, bit of, a little bit about yesterday. So the main piece here right now is this, this postponing of, the, of switching the cluster framework over to broker to the next version, because we, do, we did another iteration on the, on the broker API in particular. Um, and that kind of pushes everything a little bit back for those who remember our previous uh, roadmap from last year, um, the, the model that we want to kind of switch to a slightly different deployment model for, for bro control. Maybe eventually you will have a daemon running on all your nodes, and, and you, it's not, you can get rid of these, these, this cron-based model for uh, running bro control. Um, the deep cluster where we want to push stuff deeper into the network for distributed monitoring nodes which communicate and propagate information up the hierarchy and correlate and, 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 and aggregate at the, at the top, which is like, that will be deeply based on these, these new broker capabilities. And then um, there's another piece here that eventually once, once the, let's say the, the low level broker communication is in place, um, we would like to add new abstractions for making it easier to do the kind of work Ashish did in his scan detection talk, right? Where you need to clusterize these, these very highly stateful analyses. And then it's, it's tricky to do that. As Ashish said, it took him a while to figure out how it works because they have to essentially do it manually right now by, by sending stuff around. Um, it would be very nice if there were a script level framework which provided you with some abstractions and, and idioms for how typically you want to do this. Like, I don't know, push out stuff to workers and aggregate the results back. So if you could easily express something like that, I think that would help a lot of people to um, clusterize their scripts. And, and one, of the, one of the things in particular that, that, real, that I really like about this is the bro control D thing. It actually opens a model for people to, innate, to integrate bro in better into modern systems. So most people today, I suppose, are running systems using system D. And it's doing process supervision. And wouldn't it be nice if all your bro processes were actually being run by system D so that if it dies, system D starts it back <laughs> careful, up? Careful, careful. <laughs> but, but it would work with other process supervision <laughs> tools too. Like the point, my point with system D was just that that's the, the one that most thing, many, many things are using. Um, but it really is more about this change to process supervision. That's what I'll say. People that are using a process supervision utility, that's, that's the big change. So it, it actually is sort of a slow realization that the world has been changing. And you know, it's, this is us adapting to that change, essentially. Um, anyway, if we get to that, apparently I'm not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> no, it's, it's really just changing to make it fit better into the way systems are run and just making it an easier and more uh, integrated system. Um, dynamic configuration, that is something uh, Seth actually already talked about for, for pros earlier this year. So it didn't yeah. quite make it into 2.5, unfortunately, but we are close. It's basically just this idea, like how many of you would want to be able to just change a setting in Bro without restarting it? Yes, exactly. I, I think everybody would. I mean, it's kind of nice. Unfortunately, I just didn't get it done for, uh, for, for 2.5. And I don't think that's the worst thing either, because it would have had to internally change an awful lot for 2.6, probably. No, okay, yes, yeah, that's a nice job. I know you know the answer, but it's a nice job asking the question. Um, <laughs> oh, come on, you know the answer. The, uh, so the, the question was, is it going to enable loading and unloading scripts dynamically? And it's, it's not. That would actually require some really tremendous overhaul of, of Bro internally, and it's just not going to support that. That's something we tried many, many years ago, at least well, to some degree. Tried. <laughs> I, tried. I tried, and I failed. <laughs> 
and then okay so there's a bunch of as usual there's always more protocols more formats we want to want to parse so and, and and we just kind of brainstormed a little bit so there's certainly smb improvements you want to talk about what but do you have how, how much longer do we have two minutes two minutes, two minutes. okay Maybe okay, that was nice. I saw Jeanette come up, and I was like, "Must not have much time left." Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's things. Uh, there's things like um, improving the. They're starting to do the DCE RPC message parsing, like I was talking about, and having to add like a thousand events to Bro. It'll be ridiculous if that happens. Um, and there's just generally like right now in, S in the SMB analyzer for SMB one, there's no rename and delete support. It's just not there, and so there's just a lot of extensions and. <laughs> It, a lot of, I, my guess is a lot of the improved parsing will come from what people say, hey, this is not, it's not telling me something or this is wrong. So I think it's going to be feedback based a lot because it's hard to know what to focus on without people complaining about something. The OCSP, you've already heard, is, is uh, Johanna student has that in the queue. Um, that, that's coming pretty soon. And, and Stun and WebSocket, at least we have been thinking about and, and as nice targets um, for stuff to add to Bro. Um, yeah, let's maybe do the last two pieces here quickly. So, so OS query integration is something where we have a prototype at this URL. It's really just a prototype at this point. It's very, it's nothing you would use in any kind of production way, but it kind of demonstrates very nicely, I think, how a host-based system like OS query can complement um, what Bro is pulling out of the network. What we're doing there is essentially putting um, like, 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 um, persistent queries into OS query for host level data. So um, we, we, we ask OS query, OS query, okay, so every time they say there's a new process on the system, or every time there's a new file being created on, on the file system on a box, please send us an event back. And we funnel that, these events back into Bro, into the normal processing. So suddenly we have not only network-based events, but we also have host level events. And we can start correlating them, or even as a first step, and that is what the prototype is currently doing, just start logging that. Suddenly there's another log file coming out of Bro, which really reflects that activity coming from all your thousand end systems running OS query. So I think this is a very powerful um, thing to do, and, and we have to work quite a bit more on the technical side to make that, that feasible here and, and, and realistic. Um, but if anybody wants to play with it, um, go ahead and, and take a look. And then the, the last piece, is, is um, what we kind of nicknamed Net Control Plus Plus. So it's 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 more so it's, it's primarily a research project at this time, which Johanna is leading, um, where we are thinking that that there are a lot more tasks which um, Bro currently does in software, which in principle the network hardware could do uh, do for us. Simple example is scan detection. All this counting, this is very expensive to do in software because we need to get all the packets in there. Um, and to then not do much more with the packets than just increasing some counters. So why, why not ask the switch to do the counting? So we believe that is actually realistic, and, and we have the support um, of, of some, some, some uh, network equipment people to, to explore this, this area. And I think, and I hope, that there is a lot of like, very, very interesting work going to come out of this. But it's not a, a short-term thing. It's really a research project at this time. Yeah, I think that pretty much concludes our 2.5 uh, summary and, and outlook for the bro future. And in inevitably, the way it always ends up working is we just do other stuff that then gets added. So by the exactly. time the release happens, some, a lot of people will have just done other stuff and put it in. Yeah. And you're looking forward to many, many contributions and ideas you have <laughs> and realize and send back to us. Uh, my guess is probably next month. There, there's a few bugs, but it's nothing really major that we know about. Yeah. So we hope that, that more of you, so the beta has been out for like a couple of weeks now or something? Uh, maybe a Three bit weeks. More. You were gone three for weeks. three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> How time flies. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we, we really oh, no, it, it, the, sorry, the beta came out while you were gone. It took yeah. Johanna a week to so fix all the bugs. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so we really hope that, that, that you guys may, can give the beta a bit more testing and, and, and try, to, try it out in your environment. Let us know if anything is not working. Um, yeah. Which... No major problems so far. Some annoying stuff, but nothing major. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you want it to be released, let us know where it's broken. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.